time frame this morning. So George, but uh, goes by Rusty, uh, is in the hospital. He went into the hospital. He's been having some blood pressure problems and things, but uh, possibly uh, could be light stroked or not exactly sure yet what's been going on with him. So let's keep Rusty in our prayers. Who else do we have that we need to mention? Nancy. All right. Well, that's good. We're glad to hear that. All right. So prayer of thanksgiving there. Who else do we have? Yeah, Greg. Okay, Sharon, did you say? Okay, all right, so keep Sharon in your prayers if you would uh, as they figure out what's going on there. Who else do we have? Any others? Okay, all right. All right, yeah, let's keep Melanie in our prayers as well. Uh, Mel has decided to stop the treatments, and so let's keep her in our prayers as uh, she endures that. Any others? All right, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for giving us your son, Jesus, that we can come to you in prayer together. Um, that we can do it as individuals, Father, that we can approach your throne. Father, we're so thankful of that privilege that you've granted to us. Father, we, um, we're mindful of these that we've just mentioned, Father, that as we lift them up together to you um, in our hearts and in our minds, and Father, there may be some things upon people's hearts that, um, that they haven't mentioned that they're lifting up to you right now. Father, we praise you for deliverance in, in cases where you've done that, like in Zach's, and that he's, he's home safely. Father, we, um, we are thankful with that family. Father, we pray that you be with Sharon, that you be with Rusty and Mel and, and uh, Jerry and Karen. And, and uh, Father, there's a lot of people that um, have had various things, the flu and, and sniffles and sneezes and, and those types of things. We just pray that you would... Uh, Help everybody to become well and be able to, to be back together with us. Father, we, um, we know that in, in some of these circumstances it's much more serious. And, and Father, we, uh, we lift those up to you knowing that you understand, knowing that um, your understanding goes deeper than ours. And Father, that, um, that your kingdom can grow from things that sometimes uh, we don't like to experience. And, and, Father, we, we pray that in the circumstances that that may be the case, that, that you would uh, use your people for a light to those who are not your people, those who have not yet believed in you or committed their lives to you. And, Father, we, we pray that uh, uh, through whatever happens, Father, in all of our lives, that you would um, help us to, to be that light. Father, we know it comes from you through your son, Jesus, and, and can shine through us, Father, in, in we know that you desire for people to see that, not to see us, but to see you. And so, Father, we, we pray in all these circumstances, whether it be thanksgiving of praise or, or whether it be uh, seeking a petition from you, Father, that, that we um, uh, look for those opportunities that you provide, Father, as well as, as just uh, asking you. So, Father, as, as we... Uh, Close this, this short prayer. Father, we pray that you'd be with our time this morning as we look into your word. Father, that it will be what we need. Father, that you will teach all of us through uh, the, the scriptures that we look at. Father, that we can make application for our lives that will make a difference in somebody else's. Father, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I wanted to mention, and I didn't go ahead and, and pick one up. But the, uh, before I began the lesson this morning, um, it was brought to our attention that the uh, outline for Thy Will, and anybody who is here and you're not familiar with that, they are sitting on the back 
um, just underneath the, the mirror that's back there in the foyer. Um, there's an outline that, that we have handed out, and it's, it's thy, this is the year of thy will discovery, and then we will have 2018, thy will be done, and that explains all of what is going on in that. But it was brought to our attention um, that the names, because leadership is mentioned on there right at the very beginning, that the leadership has presented this to the church, but the names of the leadership was not on that. And so we have placed the names on those that are back there now. And so if you uh, desire to pick one of those up, of course, the, the names of the leadership, the elders and the deacons, um, are as well in the bulletin each week. So you can see them there as well. But the names are now on the sheets. If you want to pick one up that has the names on it, feel free to do that. Um, I'd like to, and there, there's maybe some uh, that aren't in here right now or that aren't here this morning. If you're an elder de or a deacon, would you please stand up? Sometimes we don't do this, and so, so these men, um, if you are a member here and you don't know their names, well, you need to get to know their names, and so uh, approach whoever it is you don't know. Go ahead and sit down, guys, if you want to. Approach. Yes, we're very proud of them. They, uh, they do a wonderful job, and there's, there's a board meeting this afternoon, and so these guys give up their time, and it's not just board meeting times, and normally, you know, I mean, uh, uh, in a lot of places, in a lot of circumstances, you say the word board meeting, and people go, oh, you know, my. Um, but it's not that way. Sometimes they, they go on a little bit longer than what we would like for them to go on. Um, but if they do that, it's always because of some very needed uh, discussion that's taking place. And, um, and the wives are very patient with that. I see Kathy laughing back there. I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, the wives are very patient with that, and, and we, we appreciate that so much. And always know that you are welcome to come. Um, if, if there's something that needs to be talked about that is extremely of a private matter that, that somebody else is bringing before the board, of course, that needs to be taken into consideration. But you're always welcome to come to a board meeting and, and know that that's the case. And there may be something you need to talk uh, to the leadership about. So we just wanted to clarify that, put that out there. Um, this morning, looking at trying to grow the church. That's the title that I decided to place on this um, for a specific reason, and it, it has to do with what we're talking about, but maybe not centrally um, in the focus of all the scriptures that we're going to look at, but the first passage I want us to go to is Mark chapter 4. I didn't intend for the sermon this morning to be necessarily uh, where I would bring up thy will as much. Um, the last several lessons ever since we have presented that have geared toward that and, and a lot of lessons through the year as we make application for ourselves. Hopefully we'll be looking at those things. And, and it will go toward that because we want to keep this ever present on our minds that we're, we're praying for these three months and, and we're headed for another time in which we're going to be examining closer, all of that. I didn't intend for this morning's to be as much about that, but in essence, I mean, there is no way that you can not tie in the scriptures and the things that we have to look at together this morning uh, without it tying into what we're doing with that. And uh, Mark chapter 4 is the first passage I want to look at. Everybody else is there, and I was talking, so. Um, chapter 4, and we'll begin, um, just so we at least have the context of this, um, look, at, look at verse 26, and really 26 through 29 here gives us uh, this, this parable of the seed. And he was saying, this is Jesus speaking, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And he goes to bed at night and gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Jesus, when he tells this parable, is, it's, it's one of the kingdom parables. And there, there are multiple kingdom parables that Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to this or to that. And in this particular parable, he's doing that. Now, what he's talking about is the kingdom of heaven is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. So he's, he's talking about seed and happens with seed. And automatically, as we've asked the question or, or at least... Uh, pose the idea of trying to grow the church. 
well, I was going to wait till later on to get to this point, but it seemed best, let's just look at it right up front. I mean, if you look at this parable, and, and the kingdom of God, I mean, as the church grows, and whether we're talking about a local church, whether we're talking about Parkview Christian Church, or we're talking about the body of Christ across the world, the kingdom of God as it is. Jesus made statements, uh, such as in Mark chapter 1, um, about verse 9, that, that the kingdom of God was going to come with power when this generation that he was speaking to was still there. So it's not, it's not that we're talking about a kingdom that is yet to come. He's talking about the kingdom that Jesus came to establish. Jesus stood before Pilate. When Pilate was asking him if you're, if you're a king, one of the very few things that Jesus answered, you know, he went as a sheep to the slaughter, opening not his mouth. He didn't give defense of himself, but he did say before Pilate, of such I was born to, but my kingdom is not of this world. Otherwise, my subjects would be fighting right now. And so when Jesus, Jesus owned being our king, even as the prophets would say, and in Revelation would say, king of kings and lord of lords. And so he has a kingdom. One, even as I mentioned in the teen class this morning, that he's going to hand over to the Father at the end of time, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. All authority, Jesus said, has been given to me on heaven and on earth before he gave that great commission that we looked at two or three weeks ago. And so Jesus, Jesus has this kingdom. And what we're seeing here is the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil, and he goes to bed at night and gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself does not know. I know I've talked about this before, but isn't it absolutely amazing to put a seed in the ground or in a water cup, and watch that thing grow, watch it sprout. I mean, you can you can get these things where you can actually see it. You know, I mean, maybe it's toward the edge of of a, a glass or something like that, and it's in the soil, and, and you you see the sprout come up, and then you see it go up the side of the glass, and you can you can watch this thing grow, and it's just amazing. I mean, for a kid to get up the next morning and look again, get up the next morning and look again. But that it does it. And that it, it has contained in that seed all the information it's going to need to make everything that that plant is going to be and to bring the fruit from that plant, whatever that might be, um, just depending upon what seed you're planting. And it has all that information, and it takes those nutrients from the soil, and it does all that. How all of that happens, how all that information is there, and that it doesn't get messed up, you know, it's interesting, man kind of messes with some of that, you know, making hybrids and stuff like that, and then it, does, it is messed up because you try to grow a, a, something else from a seed from a hybrid sometimes. How's that work out? Doesn't work, does it, Winfield? You know, it just, just doesn't work that way because they've already met, they've messed with the seed, and, and so they, they've messed that up. It doesn't work that way. But you take the, the old seed, just the regular seed of something, and, and it will produce and it will end up producing seed again. And it's got all this information on how to do that. And you can take two different kinds of seed, put them in exactly the same soil, but it's not going to produce exactly the same thing. Trying to figure all that out. But that's not our part, is it? That's not our responsibility, is to figure out how it happened. If you're going to grow a garden, I mean, you, you can work that soil, get the soil just right, you can, you can make everything, you know, make sure there's nutrients there, all of that kind of thing for all of that to happen, but you can't make that seed grow. That's up to God. This parable of the kingdom, the person is, the man's going out and he's sowing the seed. He's doing his part by sowing that seed, but he's not going to make that seed grow. That's, that's God's part. That's what he has put into that seed. And how? It says he doesn't know. The soil produces crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. He ends this part up by saying, but when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. 
Jesus, in a lot of these kingdom parables, does exactly that. He brings about the culmination of this, that there's going to be an end to this, that the kingdom's not always going to continue to grow, that there is going to be an end, there's going to be a point that God says the harvest is ready. Jesus spoke of that harvest, even, even when he was here and saying, you know, the fields are white to harvest. And so as we, as we examine this one, there's another passage I want to go to that hopefully will clarify this for us a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul is writing the Corinthians. And as we've talked about before, the Corinthians really struggled with a lot of things. They were God's people. They were the church. And, and they were saved by the grace of God. It didn't mean they had everything together. It didn't mean they had everything right. And sound familiar? <laughs> kind of like us. But there was a lot of things that they were squabbling over. There was a lot of things that they weren't getting along with each other. Uh, a lot of things that they, I mean, they, they, didn't, they didn't know how to share. <laughs> they didn't know how to, I mean, it sounded like they need to go back to kindergarten again, kind of. But in this discussion with them, in chapter 3, it starts out, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. We know he's not talking about physical food. He's, he's having to tell them simple things about Christ, simple things about the gospel, instead of telling them the things that are more difficult to understand, because they don't understand. And so he's not able to talk to them like spiritual men. He's talking to them like infants in Christ. So he says, I'm giving you the easy food, the milk because you're not able to receive the hard stuff yet. And he says, indeed, even now you're not yet able, for you're still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I am of, pa of Apollos, are you not mere men? And so here he is actually addressing a specific problem among them, and that's saying, well, I'm following Paul. Well, I'm following Apollos. I mean, and then we find out from the first chapter, I mean, there were others, there's other names being thrown out there, Cephas, which was Peter. Well, I'm a Cephas, and so they were already, they were starting to have these divisions, similar to what we see today, in some ways, these divisions in Christianity that were going to cause them to go different directions, that were going to cause them to be at odds with one another, instead of working together, all of this happening early in the church at Corinth. And because somebody was baptized by Paul, or at least they were, they were following Paul, um, they, they thought maybe they were a little bit more, more important than somebody that was following Apollos. Or maybe vice, vice versa, probably those who were following Apollos and his teaching uh, thought they were a little bit more important than those who were following Paul. And those who were following Peter were, after all, I mean, he preached the first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost. He's the one that, you know, we have recorded. And, and so they were they were at odds with each other. So he, he's addressing an issue, but in the midst of ad addressing this issue, he brings it down to the point of saying, it doesn't matter. Because he says in verse 5, what then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. Servants through whom you believed. Jesus said what of servants? He said, the greatest among you will become your servant. The least among you will become your leader or your master. Paul's writing this, and he said, if you're following Apollos, you're following Paul, it doesn't make any difference. They are just the servants by which you heard the gospel of Jesus. Jesus is the important part here. Verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, 
but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. And then he goes on with more analogy about the building part. Now really, I mean, as, as we read on down, there's all kinds of application there as to, to our responsibility and what we do and how we build. Because he goes from being a field to then being a building and that we all build upon the building. And whether we use things that are going to be destroyed or whether we use things that are going to last, it's kind of like the story of the three little pigs, whether you're using straw, wood, or, or stone, or brick. And so when you, when you compare it to what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 as he goes on with the story, we need to look at how we're building. And that does have something to do with what he's talking about in these previous verses. The important part is that we recognize we're not causing the growth. So th this is where I can't help but make application as, as we are praying, as we're seeking direction, as we're seeking God to reveal to us what he wants us to do and where he wants us to go. What we need to be standing for, what ministries we need to be taking part in, maybe what ministries we need to cease, maybe what ministries we need to start, maybe what each of us as an individual needs to begin doing within our lives that adds to this body of Christ that we're not already doing. I mean, all of these things that as we seek God's direction in this, that we're not trying to determine how we're going to grow this church. Because we're not going to grow this church. If we do, then it won't be God growing it. If we grow it, it won't be God growing it. It's possible to grow a group of people. I mean, it's done in the world all the time. We could be very guilty of growing a gr group of people, but not growing the church. If the church is going to grow... God is the one that's going to grow it. And so we leave that part to him. So then, maybe just a few other scriptures to address this. In John chapter 15, there's an analogy that Jesus gives. We know it is the story of the vine and the branches. John chapter 15. Starts in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. If we're going to be what we need to be, both as individuals and as a church, it's going to be by abiding in Jesus by abiding in his love, the same love that he was sharing with these people right here. And recognizing that any fruit that we're going to be able to bear, anything that we're going to be able to accomplish, anything good that is going to come from us is going to have to come from him, not from us. Because he says apart from him, you can't bear anything. It's just like a vine and the branches. I mean, the vine comes up, and, and you've, you've driven down I-44 and up around uh, St. James and that area up in there, and, and you can see all of, the, all of the grapevines growing out in the fields. 
And, and right now, I mean, you can really see the branches. You wait until later on, and all the leaves are out, and the, the grapes are growing in on there, and you won't see the branches as much. But right now, you can see any branches that are there, and there's not a whole lot because they've pruned them back. They've, they've cut some of them off, and others they've pruned back because they want, they want those vines to bear as much fruit as possible. And so they've got to take care of them that way. God takes care of his church the same way. If there are branches that are not going to produce, he prunes it. He cuts it off. Makes it difficult for us sometimes. Because we may not always see that. Jesus made statements like in Matthew chapter 7 toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount when he says, Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. There were going to be people, chapter 25 of Matthew, people that were saying, Lord, when did we see you sick and hungry and unclothed and not helped you? People that are claiming of all the things that they have done. Back in chapter 7, we have done many wonderful things in your name. And we've prayed to you and we've fasted. And Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Why is that? Because they've been cut off, because they didn't bear any fruit. We can be guilty of doing everything that we do religiously, but not bearing any fruit for the kingdom of God. And if that happens, he cuts us off. So if there can be somebody that is saying, Lord, Lord, and they're, they're saying that in their life, but their heart is not right with God and they're not bearing any fruit for him, we may not recognize that. We may not even see that. But at the same time, as he gives this analogy, you, you, have, you have this vine coming up and these branches coming off. Even the ones that are bearing fruit, he prunes. You suppose that feels good? It doesn't sound like it would feel good. I mean, it, it kind of coincides, and I'll let you just look at this one on your own time. In Hebrews chapter 12, where he describes, and you just jot that one down or listen to this later on and remember what it is. But Hebrews chapter 12, he talks about disciplining us, that if we are a child of God, God is going to discipline us, and discipline at the moment never feels good. It's not what we want to have. But he does that to correct us. So sometimes we have to go through things. We have to experience because it's going to make us grow. That's God growing us. Anybody ever heard of uh, Osgood Schlatter syndrome or disease? Anybody? Okay. Yeah, you know what it is, you know what it is Tim? You've got it. All right. Doc knows what it is, several of the rest of you. It's, it's when your bones grow so fast. I mean, you're, you're growing and as a teenager and your bones grow so fast and they don't keep up with the ligaments. Is that pretty accurate in a, in a rough, uh, non-technical way? But you're growing too fast. You're growing so fast and it starts hurting. I mean, typically knees, right, Tim? Typically you're going to feel it in your knees. Growing pains is what they used to call it. Growing pains. And so if we're going to grow, and if we're going to rely on God for that growth, that means he's going to have to discipline us. He's going to have to prune us. Even if we are producing fruit, he's still going to prune us so that we produce more. We're going to have growing pains. As we think about these things together, I guess a question that we would have to ask
is what are we to be sharing with people? If we want the church to grow, typically our response to that is we start telling people about the church. Is it our task to share the church with people or to share Jesus with people? Share Jesus with people. That's, that's what we're here to do. Which one has no flaws? The church or Jesus? Jesus, right? We know he cleanses us. He, he washes us. We know that we stand before God perfect only because of the blood of Christ because we actually do have flaws that have to keep being forgiven. But we know we have those flaws. If, if we go out here and we try to convert somebody to the church, we're missing the point. We're not going to succeed in bearing fruit for God. Which one would you want to market? You know, if you're talking about marketing and marketing skills. The church or Jesus? Did everybody else cringe in the idea of marketing Jesus? Are we, is it our job to market Jesus? Or to be marketplaced ourselves. I mean, where we are. What he has given us to do. Whether it's in the case of Paul, who you would think God would want him preaching, I mean, full time everywhere that he could be. But here he was in a marketplace building tents. The Apostle Paul? I mean, of all people, I mean, we read his, the things that he wrote down. Now, Paul himself said he wasn't very eloquent of speech. He, he didn't speak like he wrote. So I don't know what he spoke like. I don't know whether he stuttered. I don't know if he just had a hard time getting it out, but he sure got people's attention on occasions where he did speak, and we can read of some of the times he spoke, and it seemed to be really good. And you would think God would use him I mean, right out there among the people every day. Wait a second. In the marketplace, building tents, who was he with every day? The people. Is anybody here alone every day of the week? I'm not talking about how you feel. If you do, then we need to talk some more about that. But is anybody here not around anybody all day long, every day of the week? Okay. I saw extremely few. Extremely few. It's not every day of the week because this is a day of the week too. So you're here. God has placed you somewhere. You have seed to plant. We have Jesus to share with the world. If we will share him, the story of what he did, the love that he has shown. If you love somebody with all your heart, can you help but talk about them to other people? Anybody fallen in love recently? You may not want to raise your hand. I don't. It's Valentine's, okay? <laughs> Dale, I'm going to pick on you. When you fell in love with Kathy, did you tell anybody else about it? <laughs> Kathy, when you fell in love with Dale, did you tell other people about it? All the time. Anybody else fall in love with you want to you want to you want to share that? Why is it all the women are raising their hands and the guys aren't? Guys don't want to admit this, right? 
You mean you, did, you guys didn't have a best friend that you didn't talk about the person you'd just fallen in love to? Normally, if you fall in, okay, I'm seeing, all right, Dale's admitting it now. Okay, all right, guys, we've got the strongest man here. He just admitted it, so. If you're head over heels, turn to Mark chapter 12. Verse 28 says, One of the scribes came and heard them arguing, and recognizing that he answered them well, Ask him, What commandment is the foremost of all? Praise team, you want to come up? What commandment is foremost of all? Jesus. Jesus answered, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, And with all your strength. Does that sound like head over heels? With all your heart, you love him. If this doesn't fit you, you've missed the most important one. The most important thing that Jesus said we can do as people is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength absolutely head over heels in love with Jesus. Then sharing him with with people is no longer your duty. It's what you want to do. It's no longer just given to you as a responsibility. You can't help but talk about somebody that you love with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Do you? I mean, that's our question, right? He follows this off about loving each other, loving your neighbor as yourself. He says there's nothing greater than this. The man that asked Jesus the question, he was a scribe. He said, right, teacher, you have truly stated He is the one, and there is no one besides him. And to love him with all the heart and all the the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. I mean, this man was getting it right. When Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, it says nobody would ask him a question. If you love Jesus with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, you're at least not far from the kingdom of God. That's the start. Collectively this morning, let's recognize with each other It is not our responsibility to grow the church. But hopefully we love Jesus so much that we're going to share him with people. And through that, he will grow the church. If you personally are not involved in that process, pruning at some point takes place cutting off of branches at some point takes place. Jesus said so. That's pretty heavy. But Jesus meant it that way. So if you need to respond to that, we have an invitation. If you need, come as we stand and sing.